HBR presents. Five G, the fifth generation network. It's been touted as a real game changer. TechCrunch says that with the leap to five G networks, we can start to completely reshape entire industries. We can rethink how we run our cities and manage critical national infrastructures. 5G will deliver data 40 times faster than the current maximum speeds. That means machines can communicate instantly without any human intervention and do things on our behalf and for our benefit without our engagement. Exciting, right? And also a little scary, because along with all the promise of the 5G network comes the same peril of network security that's always existed with the internet. And the more we come to rely on it, the more vulnerable we are. Today on Cold Call, we've invited Professor Meg Rithmeyer and case protagonist Keith Crock to discuss the case entitled "The Clean Network and the Future of Global Technology Competition." I'm your host Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call on the HBR Presents Network. Meg Rithmeyer studies the comparative political economy of development with a focus on China and Asia, and she is the author of *Land Bargains and Chinese Capitalism*. Keith Crock is the former Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, and he has a long and distinguished career as an entrepreneur and business leader, including as the Chairman, President, and CEO of DocuSign. And he holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, and I could go on and on and on, but I won't because we have a great conversation to get to. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks so much for having us. Great, Keith. We love having the protagonist in on the conversation because you experienced it, you lived it. So we're really going to be、uh, interested in hearing your perspective and insights on on how all of this unfolded. Meg, it's a great case, and it's sort of ripped from the headlines. So I think people will be really interested in hearing, you know, your take on why you decided to write this case and how it relates to what you do as a scholar. Let's just dive in. Before we get started, Meg, I'd like to ask you to tell us what would your cold call be when you step into the classroom to start this discussion. Well, there's only one question to ask in this case, which is evaluate the Clean Network Initiative. So, was this a good idea? How did it go? And in terms of cold calls, it's an interesting one because the students will have. They, I mean, they have very different perspectives. Some based on where they're from. Some, you know, even among American students and among Chinese students, there's very different perspectives on this. Yeah, and you've been studying China for many years. Why did you think that this was an important story to tell, an important case to write? Well, my research over the last several years has really been about China's industrial policy, China's science and technology policy, and you know, as you said, I, I am a specialist on China. My first book was on、uh, property rights in China. Now my research is much more about China's role in the world and other countries' reactions to China and what it means for global capitalism. And so, I wrote this case for the course that I teach in the second year of the HBS MBA program, which is called Managing International Trade and Investment, and it's usually firm-based cases that look at the politics and macroeconomics of Globalization. So, you know, when I'm teaching my students about globalization and the rules that govern, right, their business environments, the relationship between the U.S. and China is huge in structuring business environments, not only, you know, in the United States and in China, but in every country across the globe. You read this case and you realize, gosh, what must it be like to be the CEO of a telecom company in Spain and have the Under Secretary of State from the United States calling you up and telling you, you know, this is the kind of business decision you should and should not make, or we strongly encourage you to do this. And this is not the typical mode of doing business, of doing diplomacy. But I think the case and the scenario of Chinese firms in the world and American political reactions to those Chinese firms, it's heralding kind of a new era for how globalization works and how states are interacting with firms. And clearly, this is high drama. And for our students, they're sitting in this classroom doing their MBA, like Keith did a few decades ago. Then Keith goes on to run, you know, a few companies, and then finds himself in the middle of a geopolitical firestorm where he's using both politics and a business background to think about a problem of extreme importance.、Um, you kind of can't get more dramatic than that. So as a case, it's 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 kind of perfect to talk about U.S. China, to talk about what role businesses have, business leaders have. It's an opportunity I could not turn down. I'm waiting for the Netflix series. I know that's going to come. Out soon,、uh, <laughs> Keith. We're going to find out from you directly in a couple of minutes what making those calls was like and what the reaction you got was. But before we go there, Meg, let me just ask you to set the stage a little bit more for us by talking about 
China's investment strategy and their manufacturing strategy in the U.S. and sort of how that relates to the case? I started at the school 10 years ago. China was a destination for foreign direct investors, for manufacturers. Um, it was kind of a, a low value add, you know, labor arbitrage kind of role in global supply chains. And now the China that we have in 2020, which is when the case is really set, is a technological behemoth that is seeking to become, you know, uh, even more capacious in its technology than it has been over the last uh, 15 years. And so that transformation has everything to do with the clean network, the global financial crisis kind of revealed to China's leaders how much they depended on foreign demand, on exports. Later, other kinds of episodes revealed how much they depend on foreign technology. And so here, the Snowden revelations are really important. So frequently, I start talks on things like this by saying, you know, there's a national security agency in inserted a backdoor into a company's technology um, for a foreign country. And actually, it's Cisco and the NSA. <laughs> when China learned that, they got incredibly scared that we're depending on semiconductors from abroad, we're depending on mainframe computers that are existing in the United States and elsewhere. And so they adopted a drive to domesticate that technology called Made in China 2025. China has had state-owned enterprises for a long time, but Made in China 2025 in this new industrial policy is about sending state money from the Chinese government to firms of all kinds, no matter who owns them. It's very difficult now. You look at any company in the Chinese economy, and if they're in any sector that's important to the future, AI, semiconductors, electric vehicles, batteries, anything like that, you're going to find some element of state ownership in that firm that presents this tremendous political challenge right, to the rest of the world, which is how do we think about where the Chinese state ends and firms begin? And that kind of political problem is one that I think Keith and his team were dealing with. And then we saw this huge rise and then fall of Chinese high-tech investments in the United States. And so this idea that what they should do with this funding is in part you know, it takes forever to build your own semiconductor. There's this law about it. I won't go into it. But, you know, it's very difficult just to develop all this technology yourself. And so the idea was, well, we should go out and acquire companies in the world, whether in Israel or Korea, Taiwan, the United States, that have this kind of know-how. And it took a few years for people in the United States and in Korea and Taiwan and Israel to say, gosh, what is happening here? We're nervous about this, right? We're nervous about these investments. And so then you start to see a bunch of policies like the overhaul of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, those kinds of things which are limiting Chinese investment in the United States. But then you come to what do you do then about the presence of Chinese firms in other countries, countries that we trade intelligence yeah. with, countries that we work in. And that is the problem really that that is at issue in this case. So that means it gets it gets very complicated very quickly. Keith, let me turn to you. So I, I've got to ask, what were your responsibilities at state? And did you know what you were getting into, I guess, as part of the question? Well, I originally came... Uh, uh, to Washington because of what I had seen in China uh, in terms of uh, DocuSign when I was running DocuSign. You know, I've been going there since 1981. And, but this time uh, it was different. I went on a listening tour uh, over there to see if we should enter, enter the market. And I could see how much uh, dictator Xi really amped up uh, aggression. I could see their economic aggression. I saw you know, the drone swarm strategy. Everybody was telling me to download Tencent every, every 30 minutes. And, um, you know, uh, all I knew is the guys with the best technology win the war. So I went out to Washington, uh, not really knowing anybody, but one person. And then I got asked to, uh, I got asked to serve. And, uh, you know, I had experienced um, intellectual property theft from the Chinese when I was uh, the CEO and, uh, of Ariba, uh, you know, I had seen yeah. what happens when we build manufacturing plants over there when I was VP of General Motors um, and, and those kind of uh, things. I could actually see what the weapons of, of mass production uh, have done back where I grew up in Ohio, where uh, my dad had a five uh, person machine shop and I, I was welded in there at age 12. So, um, so I knew uh, I would get this uh, mission, and um, I was responsible for running United States economic uh, diplomacy. And, and, you know, one of the questions they asked me in my Senate confirmation uh, hearing is, what would be my China strategy? And I said, my, my China strategy would, would basically uh, be, be three things, and it would harness the U.S.'s biggest competitive advantage. Number one, rally our our allies and our partners. 
Number two, leverage the resources and innovation of the private sector. And then number three, um, amplify the, the moral high ground of democratic values. So uh, when I came in, I was given the mission to develop and operationalize a global economic security strategy to drive economic growth, uh, maximize national security, and combat uh, China Inc.'s uh, economic aggression. Yeah, okay, so you started, I mean, one of the first things you did was a, a listening tour, is that right? And I'm just curious, so, so the climate at the time that you stepped into this between China and the United States, this is during the Trump administration, things were tense already because we were looking at trade wars and other things like that. You kind of stepped into a hornet's nest, I guess is, is what I'm saying. And, and you went on this listening tour. What were the kinds of things that you heard and the insights that you brought back from that? Yeah, so b before I got the authorities, our team got the authorities for 5G. I had probably about 60 bilateral meetings with foreign ministers, economic ministers, finance ministers. Uh, and, uh, and it almost seemed like almost all countries were terrified of China. Nobody wanted to use the word China or Huawei. You know, the big aha, I think, came when I, when I asked about their relationship with China. And uh, they said, well, you know, they're really important uh, trading partners to us. But then it'd be like they look like both directions and lean in and say, but we don't trust them. Yeah. And this happened over and over again. And that's really why I told my team, look, uh, we're going to make our strategic positioning all about trust because nobody trusts these guys. And all I know uh, from the business world is that uh, you do business with people you trust, you partner with people you trust, you buy from people you trust, it's the basis of, of every relationship. And that was something that, uh, you know, when you look at our objectives uh, of the clean network, uh, you know, this, this applies to all areas of economic competition uh, with China. So let's go back just for a second, because Meg, I want to ask you about this climate question as well. Dur it, it was during this period of time, and we've mentioned Huawei a couple of times, and ZTE has written about in the case. There's sort of central uh, characters in this case. Uh, can you an authority to pick up the CFO of Huawei? Um, and, uh, and, and she was being held on, on charges. She's the daughter of the founder of Huawei. Things are really amping up at this time. This is maybe some of the drama you were alluding to. How is all that sort of playing out in the background here? Well, I have to say my personal connection to this is I was on a train from Shanghai to Beijing when Huawei was blacklisted, was put on the entity list. And I was on a plane to arrive to Shanghai the week before when the trade talks fell apart. And so there is this general feeling, especially in China and among some around the world that, you know, the trade stuff, all of this is the United States just targeting China. All of this is politicized. It's making an enemy of China. Um, you know, my views on China, China are quite nuanced, you know, as is expected from somebody who's worked on China for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my strong view is that the trade conflict and what's going on with Huawei um, are very different issues, actually. The trade conflict is about, you know, these longstanding business practices that China has had, um, that other countries have also been frustrated with and these things. Whereas this issue of what do you do about Chinese high tech firms? What do you do about possible government involvement with technologies that are what we might call dual use or omni use, right? That could be used for intelligence purposes is that's a very different set of issues right and so it's it's hard because the relationship between these two countries i mean they're the two clearly the largest economies in the world they're very important countries mm -hmm. and so we tend to see all of these things as tied up together but they're actually quite different um in in some ways and so i mean the reality is with the detention of meng wanzhou um the CFO of Huawei, who you mentioned, that was from Department of Justice indictment based on Huawei, and which ZTE had also violated um, the sanctions against Iran. And if you read the indictment there, it's clear that they did, in fact, violate the sanctions against Iran. And so that's not about Huawei's business practices. That's not about its links, you know, to 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 this and that intelligence network in China. It's about violation of sanctions, and the evidence is kind of there on that. And so um, all of these issues are kind, and then the blacklisting of Huawei. Way, though that's a kind of different issue altogether and so um so it's important i think to disentangle some of this yeah. but certainly the climate between the u.s and china has deteriorated significantly and and i would say importantly um that 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 trend predated the election of donald trump 
um, mm -hmm. that in fact, at the end of the Obama administration, so, so Barack Obama was the first president who actually used CFIUS um, to block a Chinese tech acquisition. And so that was happening in 2016 and early 2017 before Donald Trump took office. Yeah, great. Yeah, Chris, and, and, and I might add, you know, but by the time we got these authorities, uh, it was clear that, uh, that the Chinese Communist Party had a master plan to control 5G communications. And this is just not about, you know, the, the, the next generation of smartphone. This is about uh, controlling power grids, uh, utility systems, sewage systems, manufacturing processes, uh, all, all communications uh, around the world. And in February of 2020, um, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, they were banging the table. Uh, in, in Meg's case, she, she takes it through where uh, at the Munich National uh, uh, Security Conference, uh, Pelosi was really uh, hammering on this uh, issue. And it, it looked like Huawei was unstoppable. They announced 91 deals. Uh, around the world, 91 contracts, 47 in Europe. They looked like they were going to run the table. It was uh, a desperate situation. The previous U.S. attempts ha had failed. And, and you know, I, I talk about or I'm quoted in the case uh, that, you know, what was going on is the U.S. was banging the table and saying, don't buy Huawei. So I come in from the private sector from Silicon Valley and I go, you know, that's the craziest thing I heard of because when I, where I come from, you don't even mention the competitor's uh, uh, name. And, and then we did something that to me was second nature, but in a government, you know, is unprecedented. I said, you know, why don't we treat these countries and these telcos like a customer? And a customer is never wrong. And by the way, we should have a value proposition. And that was a key part. Uh, that was a key part of the strategy, no doubt about it. You know, the other thing that I'd learned in Silicon Valley is that in a rapidly changing market, leadership is, it, first of all, everybody wants to go with a leader in a rapidly changing market. Huawei was the clear leader at the time. And leadership in a rapidly changing market is not defined by size. It's defined by momentum. So the object of the game was to reverse Huawei's momentum and give it back uh, to the Western uh, firms. And it was, you know, it really, as Meg said, this is a precursor for uh, China's economic aggression. I mean, this is a textbook case, stealing intellectual uh, property, uh, government subsidies, and yeah. not only research, but in financing. And, and so this was an important uh, precedent that was being set. This was a national security issue. Let's talk about your strategy for reversing the momentum. How did you start to go about doing that? Sure. So the, the clean network was part of our global economic security strategy. We had three basic pillars. The first is to turbocharge U.S. economic competitiveness and innovation. And you're seeing the result of some of that now, for example, with the United States Innovation Competitive Act, the $250 billion to invest in research. Uh, we worked with Senator Schumer, Senator Young, and drafted that. The second one is safeguard America's assets, and not just intellectual property, but also our financial systems, healthcare, education systems. All of those, uh, the CCP, uh, represents a real and urgent, and, and urgent threat. Then the third one was to build a network of trusted partners. So the clean network uh, is an alliance of, uh, of democracies, of like-minded countries, companies, and civil society that operates by a set of trust principles for all areas of economic collaboration. Those trust principles, uh, we would call the, these the United States democratic principles. Those are things like uh, transparency, reciprocity, respect for rule of law, respect for property of all kinds, respect for sovereignty and nation, respect for human rights, respect for the planet. And what China Inc. had been doing is they've been taking those democratic principles that we honor and they do not, and they've been using it against us. So in other words, 
you know, if I'm back there in Silicon Valley and I got a competitor who doesn't have to be t transparent, can steal intellectual property, uh, can use slave labor, can use these big coal fired power plants um, and, 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 and doesn't have to respect the law. I'm going to I'm going to lose. And so what we did is, uh, in essence, we took those very trust principles that they've been using against us. And in one jujitsu move, we flipped them on their back. We used it against them because they'd been using it for their strategic advantage. So basically, we weaponized the very principles that protect our freedoms. So tell us, what, what, how did you do this? What, what are these calls like? You're setting up meetings. Who are you, who are you meeting with? And what are the conversations? What's the tenor of the conversations? Because Meg pointed out before, this is a really unusual uh, way to, uh, to conduct diplomacy. Yes. So we had a three-pronged strategy, and that was with countries and with telcos and with clean companies, companies. So uh, with, with the CEO, and by the way, calling on CEOs of foreign companies, what I found is, is kind of an unconventional approach in, uh, in, in the government sector. But for our team, it was natural. I brought in 12 uh, guys from Silicon Valley who are trained in the art of economic warcraft. That's what we do out, out there in Silicon Valley because it's all about being the category king because you get 80% of the resources and the market cap. Uh, the difference is uh, you got to maintain your integrity. If you don't have your integrity, you don't have anything. So, um, you know, uh, we knew a lot of these guys, you know, the uh, Deutsche, uh, CEO of Deutsche Telekom, NTT, Telstra, all these guys, a lot of them were, yeah. it, all those guys were investors in DocuSign. So we called on them. Um, we and then obviously a lot of prime ministers, uh, a lot of economic ministers when we go to the different countries. Uh, and then with the CEOs, the clean companies, these were the end users uh, and important companies in these countries and for these uh, for these telcos. Uh, and that came uh, into play very strategically in our seven value propositions. So here's how it would typically go. Oh, you know, um, we, you know, we, we, we're going to put Huawei in, um, you know, we're going to put them on the edge, not the core. Uh, they're really uh, inexpensive. Um, and, 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 and what I'd say is I go, um, you know, first of all, um, you know, 5G is a system. So if you have them on the edge, they're in the core. Uh, the second thing is, so they're charging you money. Well, uh, you know, if they're charging you money, you're getting ripped off because in a lot of countries and for a lot of telcos, they're giving away for free. Why? They want the data. Um, and let me tell you about this National Intelligence Act, which I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know existed when I was uh, back being a CEO. And that is that uh, any, any company, a state owned or otherwise, any person has to turn over any information, proprietary technology, intellectual property, or data upon request to the, uh, to the party, Communist Party, the PLA, or the government, which is basically one of the same, or you suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I would say is, look, um, so let, you know, the question comes down to one question, one question only. It's not about the technology or the finance side. It's who do you trust? And in Europe, it's like, do you trust two European vendors? Or do you trust two Chinese uh, uh, providers that, you know, have stolen intellectual property? They have this intelligence law. Because who do you trust with your citizens personal data, your company's proprietary technology, or your country's most important information. Yeah. And because that's priceless. And that's and that was the thesis. And that resonated big time. So Meg, is this uh, this is hardball unlike has been played with China before, I guess that's my question. 
Well, it's a couple of things that are different from before. I just want to reiterate, you know, or emphasize what Keith said, this national intelligence law. So it's a part of a suite of laws that China has passed really since 2013. So cybersecurity law, national security laws, et cetera, which are, you know, they do have such a vague phrasing and such wide jurisdiction for the party state. And it made a huge difference, right? Mm So in a place like the UK, which... um, you know, had a technical solution to the Huawei issue. So they established this Huawei Oversight Center where they were looking at the source code from the company. So basically the issue being, you can't put in a back door because we have our technical experts sitting observing your code in the UK for the the equipment that Huawei was deploying. But then, you know, once you have this law in China that basically, and we don't know how it's implemented because we have, I mean, when, when the, when the Chinese security agencies, you know, implement the law, we're not going to hear about it. It's not going to be on the front page. So we don't know. And it changed the minds of a lot of countries. And so one thing I do in class, um, which is a really fun thing to do, which is I say to the students, if you were Huawei, how would you feel about this law? And they say, gosh, I would hate it. Mm-hmm. Right. Because, of course, then, you know, all of this work we've done for years trying to figure out who really owns Huawei, who does Huawei really answer to? Well, it doesn't matter anymore. If you have a law like this in China and, you know, I've heard a lot of people from a lot of different parts of the Chinese tech sector, et cetera, say they hate these laws because it makes it impossible <clears throat> for them to persuade foreign yeah. countries that they're really operating commercially and won't have to hand over their data. Legally, they do. So it mm-hmm. makes a huge difference. Um, but, yes, this is this is unprecedented. So there are a number of things about, you know, what's going on here. It's, you know, the idea that the United States would be devoting incredible diplomatic resources to a global campaign against a single company is really unprecedented. And I think it shows you how kind of global capitalism is changing with the entry of China, right? This model that is new to us um, is changing the way that business is done. And one thing that's significant here is that this was an attempt, you know, at multilateral negotiation. It was diplomatic. It wasn't about, you know, getting in people's faces, um, or at least not primarily about that. And, um, but, and the other thing that's interesting about it is that not only do you have under Secretary Kroc asking you choose one firm over a Chinese firm, but choose a European firm. So there are no American 5G end to end. Um, you know, and, and there, there's just no company that can do this in the United States. And so I would love to hear Keith talk a little bit about that as well. What is it like to advocate for European com- companies when you are, yeah. you know, the Under Secretary of State for the U.S.? So what's the what's the view for U.S. competitiveness? Because I, I think that's quite interesting. If you look at the objectives. We had three objectives for the clean network. I think this is really, really an important point because it wasn't just about 5G. Uh, and it wasn't just about Huawei. The first objective was to really prove that China Inc. is beatable by defeating the CCP's master plan to dominate 5G. So the clean network represented the first government-led initiative that actually defeated uh, China Inc., um, and, and, and a very important one, and that is dominate 5G, which is the backbone for their surveillance state. Um, and there's no question that they are tied to the Chinese Communist Party. But there's a second part to that objective one, and that is uh, to open up the playing field and enable U.S. entrants and other countries' uh, entrance to the market because they had been subsidized in Huawei so much that the pricing umbrella was so low that it didn't make sense for the big tech players to jump in the market or the innovators to go. So we had to neutralize them, lift the pricing umbrella so these guys could earn a profit. Indeed, that happened. And now Microsoft's coming in, Dell, Cisco, all these innovators. The second objective was to deliver an enduring model uh, uh, for competing with China Inc. measured by meeting 10 essential factors. Uh, And there's a a chart on that in in the case study on those 10. We clicked them all off. But it's things like executability. It's things like repeatability. It's things like affordability. Uh, The final objective was to provide a beachhead and a head start uh, for uh, building a strategic platform that could be leveraged in all other sectors of economic competition. And we, uh, you know, after a few months, we announced clean cloud, we announced clean apps, clean cable, um, uh, clean carrier, uh, clean cloud. And uh, we also had programs going in terms of uh, clean infrastructure with clean financing, which uh, was the Blue Dot Initiative, which uh, now is the B3W, which uh, the G7 nations have accepted. We had uh, 
uh, clean minerals with clean energy. So uh, it was, uh, this is really uh, a model going forward. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the important points out there is that with this being uh, the only successful government-led initiative where, that really has proven tangible result, this is a great model going forward. Yeah. Well, Meg, let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, uh, this didn't come without criticism. So I'm wondering, what did the critics have to say about this? And, you know, is there validity to some of the criticisms? they say many many things um and so so yeah i mean well so let me say a few of the prominent criticisms right so so one is and you heard keith just talking about you know it's an alliance of democracies etc so one criticism is and one student did say in class well why is vietnam a member you know what's croc doing in the uae right these are not democracies and so um but you know which leads you to think you know okay well should this be about democracies or should this be, you know, pretty hard, cold, real politique, right? Don't accept China. We clearly share intelligence with countries that are not democracies, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, right? And so do we want those countries using Huawei or do we want, you know, them not using Huawei? Um, and so one, you know, criticism that students have is, you know, it's nice to hear someone talk about, you know, values, et cetera, but please give me a break. The United States does not really care that much about those values in other countries. Another, you know, is, you know, the United States is just weaponizing its uh, critical hub, right? So if you think about how sanctions work and what does it mean to blacklist a company, um, put it on the entity list, right? Which is that, you know, we're basically saying, like we did with, you know, Huawei and ZTE in Iran, if you have any U.S. business, right, then you're exposed to U.S. law and the, that our sanctions are applied ter extraterritorially, right? So any country that does, that violates the U.S. sanctions, right, even if they have nothing to do with the United States, if they have other business in the United States, then they're vulnerable. And so, you know, a lot of what you, what, what some criticism is, is like, look, this is the United States bullying countries to take a side in a fight that's between U.S. and China. It has nothing to do with me. And so my best response is if I think U.S value chains in semiconductors or in other things are going to be weaponized in this fight, I should disintermediate the United States, right? So, um, you know, so you find interesting companies that are saying, great, now I have to have a supply chain that is, you know, compliant with China's views and a supply chain that's compliant with the U.S. views. It's going to be more expensive yeah. um, and it's going to be frustrating to me. And so, um, so what, you know, what impact does it have on the United States? And you know, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with these different kinds of criticisms, but they're things that have been said. One criticism that came from China, which was, this has no stability, right? We know that U.S. administrations change every four to eight years. And, you know, this, you know, clean network thing was really successful in a year, getting, you know, 60 something countries, keep can tell you the numbers to sign on. But who's to say that they'll stay signed on for the next two years? This isn't NATO. It's not a treaty, right? It's just a soft agreement. And that's what made it fast and effective. Mm -hmm. But it's it's also what makes the commitment kind of shallow. Um, so yeah. those are the main the, those are the main criticisms that come up in class and in, and in, in discussions of it. But you know the one thing I think that's really important is that this is um, democracy versus authoritarianism, and um, and if you look at those trust principles, um, respect for rule of law, respect for sovereignty of nation, respect for human rights, respect for the planet. These were the key things that it was based on. You know, another criticism was uh, that um, uh, China, China couldn't join the clean network. And by the way, that was not true at all because the trust tenets of the clean network explicitly state the goal is to include all countries and organizations as participants. The countries that currently do not abide by the trust principles will be excluded from clean network membership until they reform the problem as practices and law. So no nation is excluded forever. Uh, and the clean network doesn't require a country to choose between a partnership with the U.S. or any other nation. And I think that was really um, uh, important. So what it does is at the end of the day, we got 60 countries representing two thirds of the world's global GDP, 200 telcos, a host of clean companies from uh, Oracle, HP, Fujitsu, Siemens, NEC, uh, companies like that uh, on the clean network. And at the end of the day, it, it, it actually puts, uh, and I think this was an aha for the class, was it puts 
uh, China in a catch-22 because they either live by these principles and change their practices or they are, they're going to get excluded from, you know, potentially 80% of the market. Uh, their choice. And the important thing uh, in this type of economic statecraft is to maintain uh, the moral high ground. In other words, it's your choice. Um, and it's based on these, uh, on these trust principles. And, uh, you know, the other key thing was uh, this was not America alone. You know, on my, my first trip when I went over to Europe, uh, the first folks I met with was NATO, and that was when Deputy Secretary Gio, uh, uh, or uh, Secretary General of NATO, uh, Giovanna said, look, we need the clean, Na uh, clean NATO network. We need these 5G systems in peacetime and wartime, and we can't have some countries with trusted systems and some with untrusted, you're only strong as your weakest link. He was a great ally. And then uh, I went... Uh, across, literally almost across the street, but to the EU. And I met with my old friend, Terry Baton, who was the EU commissioner um, in charge of uh, the internal market and all the high tech stuff. And he had developed a cybersecurity uh, 5G toolbox. Um, and so we merged those efforts. So now we had the EU and then we got the three C's nations, the 12 three C nations to endorse it. So it was no longer uh, America, you know, America alone. It was really with these guys backing, and that that was really, really strategic. Yeah, a lot of hard work, but but obviously a lot of great progress as a result. This has been a, a fascinating conversation, Meg. I want to give you the last word as the case author. Uh, if there's one thing you want people to remember about this case, what would it be? So my answer is that we're all becoming a little bit Chinese in a way. Um, so China as a model, right, for political economy, for economic development, um, and for the, the, the way that the state relates to the economy is different than anything we have seen in modern capitalism. And so the responses that companies and countries have to that, right, are going to vary. But I think we're going to find that every country and every company adopts some of what China does in order to kind of counter it, right? So in the United States for now, we're now having huge investments in our own industrial policy, something that would have been unthinkable 20 years ago, have government mm -hmm. investments in, in, in semiconductors. I mean, this is like not what the United States government typically does, right? And so I want people to learn from the case that there are so many tools that companies and governments are going to use to address what is the perceived threat from China. China, and business leaders have got to pay attention to those tools, how effective they are, and how they're changing the competitive landscape. And so basically, what happens in China is super important for what happens in the rest of the world. Um, and, and the case really illustrates that, I think, in stark colors. And on that note, Meg Rithmeyer, Keith Kroc, thank you so much for joining me. It's been great having this conversation with you. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks so much. We're excited to be celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the Case Method at Harvard Business School. It's a year-long celebration kicking off this month alongside our new academic year. If you want more on the history of the Case Method, visit our website, hps.edu slash casemethod100. Cold Call is a great way to get a taste of the Case Method. After all, each episode features a business case and its faculty author. You might also like our other podcasts, After Hours, Climate Rising, Skydeck, and Managing the Future of Work. Find them on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Thanks again for joining us. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, an official podcast of Harvard Business School, brought to you by the HBR Presents Network.